<laughs> John and I were getting lost because being the dean, he has information that I, I needed to pursue <laughs> my ministry. But it is time for the main event. We brought you from a faraway place known as St. Tim's <laughs> to be here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, once and again, please get up for John Roethlisberger. John and I were just talking, uh, and I am going to use a script. Uh, the reason being that I'm going to save you the pain of the rabbit holes I would go down if I tried to talk too loosely. Um, as you could tell, there's a lot of different stories I can approach. So um, I'm going to use the script. It's in this book, so I don't have to have a stand in front of me. Um, so first of all, let me just say how glad I am that I'm here tonight with you. I look forward to every opportunity I get to be able to share uh, some of the perspectives that have come out of the work that I do, uh, including the School for Lay Ministry, which is very important to me uh, and something I'm not always sure as to what its future is going to be. But anyway, you know, most of the holiday celebrations for most of us are done unless you've got one of those unusual family situations that you couldn't get them all here until now. Um, and so, you know, this is a time of year that we reflect on last year and we think about the things that have happened and maybe that we wish had gone differently and we anticipate what's coming ahead, uh, both this year that we're into now and uh, for some people, depending on how you calculate it, we've started a new decade. Other people will tell me, no, we don't start it until next year. but. Um, I think when you're in the 20s, you're in the 20s, all right? Um, this is often a time of deep reflection about the past. Um, so this brought me to thinking about the title that I put on this message uh, this evening, and it's called uh, Who Counts, Who Cares, and Who's Called? Um, as is usually the case, I find it easiest if I can use some of my own frame of reference uh, to try to connect or to link into this. So let's start with that, who counts? Uh, I think back to a very early time in my life when I was pretty glad I counted. Uh, our country church that I grew up in uh, that was connected to the Methodist but not a Methodist church, uh, where I first learned about God's love would always have a summer picnic. And on a hot summer day, we were near a stream where the kids were waiting to temper that heat. I was a soon-to-be three-year-old toddler, and as seems to be my habit, I would push the boundaries a little bit more than was probably wise. I started walking out further into this stream, and I mean, I do remember this walking out into that stream and I slipped below the surface of the water in one of those holes that often develops in free flowing water. I can remember that panic I felt as I couldn't get back to the surface. I can remember feeling that I was not going to make it. And suddenly a hand reached out and got a hold of my arm and lifted me out of that deep water. It was a young teenage girl who had seen me disappear and quickly acted to get me back on the solid ground. I, to this day, truly believe she saved my life. And she was one of many in that small rural area that helped all of us baby boomer kids know that we counted. As I grew, I began listening to the life stories shared around our kitchen table with the family and friends that would come to visit. Some involved war stories of World War II and Korea, where I began to understand the much bigger circle of just who counts. Having lost an uncle in France made some of those stories very close and personal for my family. Why were there people in the world who would do that? Did they count? I was learning that power could be very dangerous and not always good. 
I loved my church life. In those growing years, and really struggled, when Vietnam came roaring into my personal family life with my brother enlisting in 1964. I spent the next four years with a great big map of Vietnam on our kitchen wall. Keeping track of the places my brother would write home about. When 1969 rolled around and I was facing the draft, I followed my brother's example, and I enlisted in the Navy during the most troubled part of the Vietnam War. I traveled to third world countries, and I saw people living on the margins being abused by the people and the powers around them. Did they count? More importantly, what was my part in all of that? Who counts can be a loaded question. And the passage found in the lectionary the Sunday before last, Matthew 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23, tells of Herod's reaction to a potential threat to his power. The response was to kill the children to and under all around Bethlehem. And I have to tell you, that caused me a great deal of consternation as I was preparing for this evening. I may not always be politically correct, but age is making me somewhat less concerned about that <laughs> and focused on what my faith is asking me to demonstrate in this life a friend, and someone I hold in pretty high regard, Anna Bladel, asked a simple question about the birth story of Jesus. Did those children that lost their lives around Bethlehem because Herod was threatened, did those children count? How did their mothers and fathers feel about the birth of Jesus? If nothing else, we see that power is a dangerous thing to challenge. But most of us would agree that power must be challenged when it is being used for evil. Another good friend reminded me the other day that this story in Matthew was not the only time power being threatened resulted in children being victimized. For example, Moses being hidden in the bulrushes to survive Pharaoh's orders about the Israelites and their children. So, who counts? In the ideal world, no one is outside our circle, but I think reality would tell us there are many who feel like they are outside our circle. Even though it can be very unsettling to think about all of this, the hope that comes with the birth of Jesus is very real for many of us and truly comes to life in his ministry some 30 years later. So, who cares? This is where we find such encouragement in the Gospels through the teachings of Jesus and the parables he uses for illustration. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he demonstrates caring for those who were in need or living on the margins in acceptable society. A very familiar example of that caring is when Jesus tells about the Samaritan woman at the well, found in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. The fact that a Samaritan was used as the example worthy of care would have really stretched the faith community of Jesus' birth. The basic separation of the Samaritans and the Jews occurred when the Babylonians took the religious leadership of the area and the upper class into exile. It's kind of an oversimplified explanation, but what was left was the working class and the poor. And they developed into basically the Samaritans. When the exiled leadership was allowed to return to their destroyed Jerusalem, the Samaritans 
no longer had the same traditions and practices as the returning Jews. Samaritans were seen as an inferior people, not worthy. So when Christ uses, and this is really the catch for me, when Christ uses a Samaritan woman who has been married five times and was living with another man to talk about the kingdom of God, it certainly expanded who counts. He did the same in the story of the Good Samaritan found in Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Once more, he uses a Samaritan as the example of who is worthy of care. Then there is the woman struggling with bleeding, making her unclean by the standards of the day or the unclean leper, neither of whom were rejected by Jesus. All, I repeat, all counted as worthy of care in this new way of living. Probably the most powerful illustration of who is to care is when Jesus provides the guidance found in Matthew 25. We hear Jesus say in verse 40, very familiar, the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. But he doesn't stop there. He follows with verse 45 and these words. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Power did not entitle anyone to more care than any other individual, regardless of their status. These words found in Matthew 25 are the grounding for much of what we do in the United Methodist Church today. So I ask you, who cares and who counts enough to receive that care? Let's bring this around to the final point this evening, who's called? When my wife, Janie, and I became part of the faith community called the United Methodist Church, we were drawn by your desire to make such a difference in the world. Inside our church families, the communities in which we live, and the much broader world, you listen carefully to the needs presented to you, and you respond with your time, talents, and gifts in ways that we had not really witnessed prior to joining you. You have made decisions in your lives that clearly demonstrate your desire to live a life of inclusion, to be a place where all, and I mean all, truly count and are deeply cared for. That brings me to the need of the broader church to develop a culture of call a true culture of call. Again, let me say, who is called? As the dean of the School for Lay Ministry, I want you to know that that question is always at the front of absolutely every decision we make. Forty plus years ago, when I went through the candidacy process for ministry myself, some very wise guidance was provided to me in understanding that call, unlike many believe, is not just for the pulpit and ordination to full-time status as a pastor. The more important call for most of us in the church is to the ministry of the laity. We each serve in our own way, and one of the basics is to see each person we meet as someone who counts. One of my favorite role models was Mr. Rogers, who carried a note in his pocket given to him by a social worker. The note said, frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard their story. A more challenging call is that of speaking truth to power. 
That is a call that comes to all of us, no matter what responsibility we may have in day-to-day -day living. Moses did that, and we know the challenges he faced, many times wanting to have the load taken away. The same would be said for Jesus. And at this time of celebration around God's entering into our world as an infant, we need to remember its cost. Power can be dangerous, but must always be held accountable for its actions. So let's consider what might be your call. It might be something as simple as speaking to someone who just needs a friendly voice. It might be providing a ride to a doctor's appointment, or maybe providing somebody with a hot meal. It might be giving a little bit bigger tip to a server in a restaurant, or letting someone enter into a line of traffic where the cars are stacked up. If you can think of it, you just might want to do it. So, who counts? Well, I think a solid answer would be every child of God, or simply everyone, no matter who or where they are. So who cares? Well, our world is a much better place when the answer to this question is also everyone. Does anyone here want to guess what the answer to the last question might be? Who's called? In one way or another, I pray the answer is each of us. My heartfelt hope is that we all feel called by God to care for those who count, which truly is everyone. Amen. John Roethlisberger, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and, and welcoming a, a new season of Fusion and, and coming to hear uh, John's powerful uh, message that he shared with us tonight. And I hope it's a message that we all take with us as we leave this room. Uh, it doesn't take you hard, it doesn't take long to find issues in our world, whether it be on the news, whether it be local within your family, and it's so easy to lose sight of what it means to care for everybody. We put ourselves in camps, we separate ourselves by all sorts of metrics that in the end don't matter. As we just celebrated Christmas, we celebrated the birth and the coming of the Son of God and Jesus Christ and in a few months, we get to talk about Easter and the sacrifice that he made and the cost of what that was and what that meant for every single person on this earth, both in the past and yet to come. And it is my hope that you take his words to heart, that despite whatever you feel personally, that you see one another with that same love and that same care that Christ sees you, that you realize that every single person counts Every single person is worthy of care, and every single person, no matter where they are from, is called to be part of bringing light to this world. So I ask that you go forth this week with those words with you, and that you please, please, please be Christ for one another. Have a good night.